all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Cuke Audio podcast. Tassajara Stories. I'm DC. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, preserving the legacy of Shunju Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his and anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So uh, after our pause to meditate, we'll get right into the next Tassajara stories. So when you hear the bell, hit pause if you're of such a mind and meditate or whatever for as long as you wish. And when you're uh, through, hit unpause and we'll be there to hit the bell. That will end the meditation or whatever and then we'll get right into the next Tassajara stories. Mid-70s Guests A Tassajara guest had offered us all the pairs we could pick. So we took the Dodge flatbed and the trailblazer filled with eager students out to be fruit pickers. The owner met us with ladders and poles and gave us a stack of boxes. The flatbed has tall sides, Paul Disco and Gru had built, As soon as we got it, we about filled it to the top with those boxes, which were also filled to the top. I've noticed fruit orchards during harvest time, even single trees, display a staggering amount of droppage on the ground going to waste. I always think about how it could be salvaged and put to good use to fuel people or create electricity. I have seen nets used. You have to be careful taking fruit that's been on the ground very long because it picks up the ground's odor. But we did take pears from below trees, pears that were solid and unblemished, especially if they were lying on other fruit. Back at Tatsahara, we'd already prepared drying racks made from screens stretched over wood frames. Students were assigned to wash and cut the pears, get them up in buckets on the roofs of the office, pine and stone room to place on the racks. The hot summer sun did the rest. During the winter, we would receive those pears cooked and served in their juice in the second bowl for breakfast about once a week often with cottage cheese in the smaller bowl. I'd mix the two because the cottage cheese would be cold, like the Zendo. The pear work went pretty fast as it was popular. Students would help in their time off and guests too. A guest who was highly skilled at preparing the pears was the musician Taj Mahal who had studied agriculture and planned to be a farmer when he was younger, but he grew up in a musical family and he had a natural talent. He played us some tunes, too. He came with his wife, Inshira, and infant. Inshira was sweet and friendly, but concerned about their baby and tended to stay in their cabin. Taj was fun, solid, and outgoing, and he walked through the gardens admiring their fertility, tasting a cucumber and tomato. Diane and I 
offered to babysit Taj and Inshiraz not yet month old baby so that they could go on a hike to the Narrows and spend time down there dipping and eating bag lunches. As soon as they came back, we told them they had a very sick baby who should go to a doctor immediately. I made arrangements with Dr. Witt at the Point Reyes Medical Clinic. The doctors did what they could, but the baby couldn't digest properly and didn't live much longer. Taj and Inshara had, I believe, two babies die of that same congenital problem and finally had a healthy child. During the fall practice period in 1974, I was the new director of Tassara, having left the position of head monk, which had carried through the guest season from the spring practice period. One day, someone came up to me and said there were a few city people on the road by the big oak tree. We were closed, of course, with large signs stating so, but that happens now and then. I walked over. There were two couples dressed rather nicely, but not for the woods. A student was telling them they had to leave. I went up and told the student, I'll I'll take care of them and said hello, and what can I do for you? A man answered with a French accent. I am Jacques. This is Connie, my wife, Ginger, and Jerry Brown, who is the governor-elect of California. I said, well, please come on down. It was pretty good weather for mid-November. While someone kindly got them tea, I zipped into the office and said to get hold of Richard Baker right away and make sure he knows the new governor is here and that I'll keep them entertained till he arrives. I knew Baker was just getting ready to leave the city for Tassar, and I imagined that this would speed him up. But still, it was four hours away, less with good traffic and him driving. I showed them around, always Zendo first, then kitchen, gardens, The mid-November weather was cool, but the sun was out. I asked Jacques what he did, and he said he was a filmmaker, had worked with Godard in France, had been close with Brown since Brown was a secretary of state, which he still was till the coming year. Jacques had produced Brown's TV spots for the race and said all he did was straight talking headshots so people could see Brown up close. Jacques had a shaved head, wore wire rim glasses, and spoke enigmatically. When I asked if he would be working with Brown in Sacramento, he said, I never work. I exist and things happen. <laughs> I told Brown that most people in Zen Center voted, including those of us ensconced there in the woods, and that he surely got just about every vote, but not in the primary. The word around Zen Center was for William Roth, surely due to Baker's opinion. Brown said that the wealthy Roth was bankrolling his own campaign, selling off his valuable art collection. I didn't spend a cent of my own money, he said. (laughs) Our funky little cabin was in the upper garden. I gave them a peek, introduced them to Diane and baby Kelly, who was a little over one year old. I picked up two books and handed them to Brown. One was Jessica Mitford's Kind and Usual Punishment, and the other was Small is Beautiful by E.F. Schumacher. Conversation flowed from prison reform to ecology to health care. I mentioned that I'd heard that, at least in Fort Worth, where I came from, that in the early day of ambulances, they were owned by funeral homes, and they'd prioritize picking up the dead bodies at accidents instead of the injured, because that's where the money was. He said, I don't believe that there should be profit from people suffering. We walked up to the shop, then down to the lower garden. Brown noticed that people were working silently. 
I said at least where we've just been, but it's frequently forgotten. He said that when he was a Jesuit initiate, it was the same, that the rule was to work in silence when possible, but that there would be slippage. Same approach as Zen, extend one's meditation into daily life. He said the Jesuits had a phrase, Aji quote Ajis, do what you're doing. Down to the upper and lower barns, after which flat walkable ground tapers off. Brown asked if that's where our property ended. I said, no, but that's where our use of it ends. You want to go further? The creek was low, so everybody made it across four times on rocks with street shoes, then down a ways, me pointing out everything I remembered about the plants and rocks, which wasn't that much. We got to the approach to the narrows, which is somewhat challenging because it becomes solid granite where they uh, had to use their hands to climb up a little, but... We all made it across the bumpy but smooth surface sloping toward the trickling water to overlooking the deep pool. Reflecting on the awkwardness of negotiating this walk, dressed as they were, I questioned the wisdom of my initial suggestion. We made it all the way back, though, without any disasters took them to Stone Room 1 and said they can take it easy there after going to the baths. It was well before student time. I said we were planning on serving them dinner in the dining room. Jacques said, no special food. We eat what the students eat. It almost seemed like Jacques was in charge because he was more assertive and Brown was quieter, though he did make occasional humorous asides. Connie and Ginger seemed agreeable to whatever. I built a fire in the fireplace, the only one in Tatsahara, while they were at the baths. Finally, Baker arrived, and he immediately invited them to spend the night, which it seemed they were already counting on. They had dinner together with Baker, stayed up, talking late. Brown and his party were excellent practice period special guests. They joined us for Zazen and even did some work. Brown was in the kitchen making gomashio, sesame salt, grinding roasted brown sesame seeds mixed with some sea salt in the Portland hand mill. This grinder will only go so fast, he said. You know why? And, of course, his fellow kitchen workers asked, why? Because it's got a governor on it. <laughs> Richard Baker <laughs> Richard Baker brought so many interesting people and influences to Zen Center. I was at the city center and at Green Gulch Farm, respectively, for his initial two years as abbot. The first guest speaker I remember was Gary Snyder, whom he introduced as one of our teachers. Michael McClure did a few readings. I recall one of Minnie Mouse and the Tap Dancing Buddha, and another which was during his period of guttural and other vocalized sounds. Like McClure, Ginsburg was friendly and comfortable around Zen Center on the rare occasions they were there. I remember Ginsburg joining us for one of our rare parties. There was dancing to rock music. Ginsburg danced with Baker and Nils made fun of Baker's style. He loved to tease Baker. Ginsburg was a good dancer, pretty loose. I was inspired. We danced a bunch, and he kissed me good night. <laughs> Jerry Fuller called out, star fucker. <laughs> Poet Robert Duncan did several readings. He was a curious fellow with one eye that 
didn't focus with the other so that it moved independently, sometimes a walleye, sometimes cross-eyed. He was a mentor to Joanne Kiger, Diane De Prima, and so many, a senior to the Beats. Greeting him at Baker's apartment, I said, It's an honor to meet you, Mr. Duncan. I've long admired your donuts. <laughs> he looked puzzled. <laughs> There were talks and presentations in the dining room, such as one led by Larry L. Peterson and Joe, mm, I forget, on what they called systems energetics, influenced by the work of H.T. Odom, who urged a comprehensive look at commerce and projects to estimate the cost and value. Odom said, for instance, that rather than selling for $3 a grate, that Florida oranges should sell for closer to $30 to include the costs of the environmental cleanup from their pollution, especially of the Everglades. Larry and Joe expounded on that approach and how, for instance, they'd stopped a freeway from being built in Oregon by showing the governor what a realistic look at impact and cost would be. So we all ate it up, and they seemed to be perfectly brilliant to me. But when we had a second presentation with Governor Brown, he tore them up with many pointed questions. Maybe having him there threw them off their game. The Bakers had frequent visitors staying with them, such as Richard Alpert, uh, later called Ram Das, and his towering American yogi guide through India on his Be Here Now trip, Bhagavan Das, with his new bride, Zaftik Bhavani, an elderly Japanese Urasenke tea ceremony teacher, Nakamura Sensei, lived with the Bakers and taught tea and classical no drama, Utai singing at Green Gulch and in the city. The Bakers had lived in her home in Kyoto. Gary Snyder had arranged that. It's where he had lived. Virginia's friend, Renee de Tome, was always around and worked with Jenny, as we called her, on various projects, a big one being saving the old Sokoji Temple which the Japanese congregation was soon to move from. Their daughter Sally was there, too, living in Zen Center Grand Central. I'd heard people complain that Baker had three homes. Right, he did, with little space for him in any of them. <laughs> in Japan, abbots of temples are customarily called Hojo-san in their temple, the title refers to a small amount of space that is actually their own. I used to say, that's like calling somebody Mr. Ten Square Feet. But that would be three feet times 3.3 feet, and he had more space than that. How about Mr. Fifty Square Feet? That's seven feet by seven feet plus one. And that's about what Baker had at Green Gulch in the city and at Tassajara. And frequently, he was sharing it with a visitor, a lot of times. On top of all that, Baker had an ongoing salon with Renaissance people, futurist social planners, many sorts. Their focus was on how to make a more sane, peaceful society. Esalen's Mike Murphy, Gregory Bates, and E.F. Schumacher, visionary architect Sim Vandren, Governor Brown, Paul Lee, Michael Phillips, who wrote The Seven Laws of Money and founded the Briar Patch Network of Small Businesses, Stuart Brand of Whole Earth, Bob Ganesta of Public Advocates, astronaut Rusty Schweiker, were among those who would show up at Baker's City Place or Green Gulch. I was work leader in the city in 1972 and Baker's main shisha in 1973, so I spent a lot of time around the edge of all that. 
I don't qualify to participate or desire to do so, but I enjoyed being around, arranging the chairs, bringing refreshments, being on call. Naturally, there was spillover from all this activity that poured into Tassajara, which I experienced in the following two years. A focal point for that was the no race, which occurred on the first weekend of guest season. The No Race was an event Baker created to thank supporters and friends of Zen Center. It was so named because it was not a race. The H in No, in O-H, was borrowed from the Japanese No drama to indicate it wasn't a normal negative. On the morning of the No Race, everyone who wanted to participate, could jog or walk up the road to the first ridge, about four miles. Students were welcome to join. There were some serious runners like Mike Murphy, Dick Price, Investor Ruben Glickman. There was a husband and wife duo who'd always come in way before others. I tended to be at the tail end of the arrivals. <laughs> having just walked the whole way. There were refreshments up top and then back down, which one had to be careful of because that's harder on the body than going uphill. Of course, there would be talk and meetings throughout the weekend. It was always a stimulating time. One of the guests was William Irwin Thompson, writer, social philosopher, and poet, Thompson had founded the Lindisfarne Institute with a community at Fish Cove, Southampton on Long Island. He brought a whole new crowd of brainstormers into the mix. Baker was now on the Lindisfarne board and they'd have meetings at Green Gulch Farm. At the Tassajara swimming pool, I introduced Thompson to Stuart Brand. Thompson congratulated Brand on the Whole Earth catalog beating his at the edge of history out for the National Book Award. Thompson's book had a great way to describe Big Sur. Quote, I could see from the cliffs around me that this was the real edge of America, and I thought it was a beautiful way to end a country. Jean Fairley had been an early admirer and supporter of Thompson's Lindisfarne Society, and brought a lot of elite connections and an AA contingent to the community. At Tassajara, he talked to me about his experience with alcohol. I told him that whenever I see one of those lists that say if you check more than so many items, you're an alcoholic, that I check off most of them as such. Do you drink alone? Of course. Name something else. It's not okay to do alone. <laughs> he got very serious and said I needed to stop drinking and join AA immediately. I said that Zen Center was doing a pretty good job of keeping me away from alcohol most of the time. Richard Baker had come to be acquainted with William Sloan Coffin, who was chaplain at Yale University, and a personal hero for his dedication to peace and civil rights. I'd been involved in some civil rights activity in 64 when many white kids, mainly from the North, went to Mississippi to help register voters. Before that, there'd been little participation in civil rights work. Coffin was one of the noble exceptions among other things, he'd organized Yale students to go to the South to join the Freedom Riders. He'd been arrested many times for his peace activism. I thanked him for all his good work. Not long after that, he became minister of Riverside Church in New York City. Met a Korean music professor in the dining room. I'd grown up around classical music though I really don't know much about it. Anyway, <laughs> we got along, and then he came running up to me and asked if that man over there was a student. I said, yes, that's Jonathan. 
Uh, he said, I know, that's Jonathan Condit. He's one of the foremost authorities on Korean classical music. Jonathan had never mentioned anything like that that I knew of. A man named Barry Shapiro came in uh, who was working on a book called Handmade Houses, A Guide to the Wood Butcher's Art. He was there to see J.B. Blunk's sculpted sitting area, but also the new cabin, which had been designed by Sim Vandrin. Seeing the new kitchen was a bonus. After I showed him around, and he had digested all that and taken the photos he wanted, we went to the baths, and while sitting in the steam room, he told me how he had spent a certain amount of time in his childhood. He said his father was a bagman for the Southern California Mafia, and that his father would take him along on his rounds, collecting and giving people money, and that one person they made regular trips to give money to was an aspiring politician named Richard Nixon. <laughs> A woman named Suzanne Cloutier was staying in the last cabin downstream, the closest one to the swimming pool. She was Canadian and had been married to Peter Ustinov. She complained about what a tyrant he was. She was worried about her children. They'd had three together. He had them at the time. She talked about her film career, which was substantial. She'd played Desdemona in Orson Welles' 1951 film Othello. She said Leonard Cohen and she were close and that he'd written the song Suzanne for her. She had props from the song with her, feathers, Chinese tea, a mirror. While she was talking, I couldn't help but be distracted by the pubic hair sticking out from her swimsuit. <laughs> she... <laughs> She must have been about 50 then and looking good. But like the song says, she came on a bit crazy. She also, I learned by looking into it, was not the subject of that song. Richard Baker and Paul Lee had become friends with Black Panther founder Huey Newton. Newton's insights and poems, co-authored with Erica Huggins, had just come out with an introduction by Zentatsu Baker Roshi of the San Francisco Zen Center. Baker had given Newton a Tibetan black Tara scroll, which he hung in his Oakland apartment atop the Black Panthers headquarters. When the Oakland police raided the place, Newton said that scroll was about the only thing they didn't destroy. Newton came to Tassara with a few of his fellow Panthers. They hung out some on the furniture in front of the office, drinking wine from jugs, chatting with themselves mainly, but others who came up and introduced themselves. Some students who'd gone over to their Oakland Center to help them with a project came up to say hi. They kept to their rooms a lot. Newton was easy to talk with. He said he felt awfully safe at Tassahara, but he liked living in the city. He only talked with people outdoors. Their rooms were off limits, including for room cleaners. I teased him about that, and he said we didn't want to see what was in there. And then he said, don't worry, I've got permission, and he winked. At first, I wondered what he meant, but then I remembered the rumors of cocaine and heroin. Hmm, maybe that's what the cops were looking for. Bert Schneider and Bob Rafelson came several times to Tassahara with their mates. They were in the entertainment business and, for starters, created the wildly successful rock group called The Monkees for a TV show they put together. They worked with a friend, Jack Nicholson, on their first movie named Head, which Rafelson described as an utterly and totally fragmented film. <laughs> Rafelson said that Nicholson was involved in all of their excellent movies, which included Easy Rider, Five Easy Pieces, The King of Marvin Gardens, Bogdanovich's the Last Picture Show, and Hearts and Minds, the Academy Award-winning documentary 
on the Vietnam War. I was sitting with Ravelson on the lawn in front of the office when a man reading nearby came over and introduced himself. He had recognized Ravelson, said he was a writer who lived in Carmel Valley, had never praised any film to the filmmaker, but that he had to tell Ravelson what an excellent film The King of Marvin Gardens was. I mentioned to Ravelson that Huey Newton had been there earlier in the summer. He said he knew Newton, that they had made a film for the Panthers with an agreement that the Panthers would just cover their basic costs. When they delivered the film, however, instead of payment, they were met with a drawn pistol. Iris Simons was one of three radical members elected to the Berkeley City Council in the early 70s. Berkeley was having constant confrontations between police and what were termed radicals, mainly young white students and (laughs) dropouts. Simons and his cohort on the council to Army Bailey were lawyers. It was hoped they'd help reduce the chaos in the streets, but it seemed like they were just creating more chaos in the meetings. At least that's the reputation Bailey had, and Simons was reputed to be Bailey's rubber stamp. Bailey was recalled, and Simons wasn't reelected. Simons and his wife were easygoing, and he was so mild-mannered, I couldn't imagine him being disruptive or uncooperative. When Diane and I were in the city, we had dinner with them at their warm, woody Berkeley home. Inside, the house was filled with racist memorabilia that only they would dare to display. He told me about his experience with Huey Newton and the Black Panthers. He and D'Army Bailey were invited by Newton to the Panthers' headquarters in Oakland after they were elected. They arrived in the early evening, and Simon said that without any provocation or need to do so, Newton pulled a gun on them. (laughs) He took credit for their victory because the Panthers had supported them. He demanded that they, as African-American brothers in the struggle, see to it that the Berkeley City Council votes to give the Panthers a million dollars. When Bailey said that would be impossible, Newton and his colleagues threatened to throw him out the window, and they were on the top floor of a multi-story building. After they'd pushed him halfway out, he begged for mercy and promised he'd try. Simons and Bailey were released at sunrise after a long night of terror and Newton's constant snorting cocaine and lecturing. Shunyu Suzuki once said that at his temple in class-conscious Japan, people of various ranks would visit, but once they entered, their status was the same. To me, all Tassahara guests were equal, but when parents of students came, I'd forget that and pay extra attention. Some, like Dan Welsh's Quaker parents, arrived already pleased their son was there. Others were open-minded and curious. By the time they left, almost all had a positive take on what their offspring were doing. Zen Center was clearly not a cult that separated people from their families or their inheritance. When Diane and I were married, part of the ceremony was to do prostrations before our parents which included my mother and grandmother and Diane's mother and aunt. (laughs) There were occasional parents who arrived upset because they had other aspirations for their progeny's trajectory, such as Susan Winder's parents, who'd hoped she'd become a lawyer for social justice, Her mother bemoaned that instead of focusing on that, her daughter was wasting her time here instead of living in the real world. Well, I said she wouldn't be spending the rest of her life at Tassara and could resume those studies any time she wanted. 
but that you can't get away from the real world. She could die here. That's as real as you can get. Mm, I don't think that helped. <laughs> there were some parents who were far too opposed to consider coming. Jordan Thorne's father said he was going to have the place bombed. Tim Burkett sent a copy of the Wimbell to his parents, and when his father saw that his son was listed as a donor toward the purchase of Tassahara, he disowned him. Dana Dantine was in the kitchen. He'd been at Zen Center since the late Suzuki days. His father came in from L.A. and spoke with a charming German accent. He was a serious and thoughtful man and quite respectful of the practice and people at Tassara, but he was concerned that his son was not taking advantage of the opportunities he had to become more worldly wise. He did not mention career. He said that he wished Dana would spend time in Europe and traveling. He was worried that his son was stuck in a small nook of a big world that he had a ticket to. I said there was nothing here to stop Dana from getting to that. It's not a place to settle down, that people come here to strengthen themselves so they can be more effective in whatever they do. It's up to them, though. I showed him a little book with the 10 ox herding pictures, a traditional Zen theme found in China, Korea, and Japan. It starts off with the novice looking for the ox, finding it, taming it, riding it, and the last picture is returning to the marketplace, bestowing gifts. He said that was reassuring as long as the first nine steps didn't take most of one's life. <laughs> uh, I said that Suzuki didn't teach what he called step letters in, and that we could see each step is happening at the same time or not in a fixed order. And of course, we return to the marketplace while we're still on the other steps, except in this story. He told me not to call him Mr. Dantine, but Helmut. I immediately pictured a soldier's helmet as an aid to remember. I asked him what he did. He was in the movie business and had been working with Sam Peckinpah. He said that just before coming to Tassahara, he'd edited straw dogs for television and, quote, had to cut the guts out of it. He was dismayed with Nixon having been reelected, but said that McGovern, unfortunately, had made himself unelectable. He talked about how he was going to visit his old friend Kurt Waldheim, who was Secretary General of the United Nations. We got to talking about the total lack of a moral compass, honesty, concern about people in advertising and so much big business. He said there are good people in both, of course, but that corporations especially have so much power and inevitably move toward increasing profit is the only goal. Then he said something memorable. They'll give cancer to babies. There's no doubt about it. Now, now Sakaki, with full graying beard and bushy hair around his ears, walked in unexpectedly one day. He'd come in over the Tony Trail. Some of the students there knew him because he'd been hanging out around Zen Center. There were apartments in the area with students taking rooms and sharing the kitchen and bathrooms. He moved from one to another, never staying long enough to be a burden. He'd write and recite poetry and walk around town. Then he'd disappear and go elsewhere, often into the wilderness. He hiked mountains in Japan and America with his close friend Gary Snyder. Now, now it had taken days to get from Big Sur to Tassara. I have been in Deep Mountain chanting Sutra. <laughs> he had a flair for short, dramatic statements with a smile. I'd heard of Nanao for years, first in connection with a community called the Tribe he'd helped to form on the southern Japanese island of Suwanose. I thought of him as the godfather of Japanese hippies. He told us about his time in the war. 
He was stationed at a little radar station on the island of Kyushu, just him. He kept his beard, which was against regulations, but he got away with it due to his isolation. Once they were being attacked with bombs and strafing, and he decided to go outside and take a look. A plane flew so close to him that he could see the pilot had a beard, too. The pilot saw him, and they waved to each other. He'd order supplies and could get whatever he ordered because a radar station was important. He'd say he needed stuff for his radar station that was actually for the village, including once a large bag of sugar, which was scarce in Japan during the war. (laughs) He said that after the war, he went back to work as a normal person but couldn't do it, quit and started walking around Japan, which he did a great deal of for years. Back in Tokyo, he slept under a bridge, got involved with sculpture and poetry, published a book of poems, which Gary Snyder saw, and they met in 1961. He asked to go to Suzuki Zash's site so he could sit there and chant. I'd asked if he'd ever met Suzuki. Then I said, yes, I met him two times. Both times were at the Zen Center on Page Street in San Francisco. The first time, Richard Baker took me. He introduced us. I said hi, and he said hi. In English? Yes. Everyone else was speaking English, and we could too. And hi is not so difficult English. <laughs> Suzuki Roshi loved to say hi, I said. He said it a lot. I think it always had a little bit of the Japanese height in it, you know, yes in Japanese. So with him and with everyone at Tassara, there was always a lot of hi yes and hi hello, and they were mixed together and had a sort of positive gambate, go for it, encouraging sort of feeling. Yes, he said, and repeated the word a few times. Hi, hi, and then Hello, we will do it. Perfect. That was Suzuki's spirit, I said. So you said hi, and then? That's all. Just hi. It was enough. I could see his great spirit, and he could see me. And the second time I met him was when he was dying. Gary Snyder took me, and we visited him. And we had exactly the same conversation we'd had before, just hi and hi. And we bowed our heads a little. Hmm, so you and Suzuki Roshi had two meetings over the years, and the sum total of what you said to each other in both meetings was four words. Actually, one word four times. Yes, it was just right. I am so happy to have met him He was a great teacher for America. This has been a Cuke Audio podcast, Tassara Stories. I'm D.C. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Dog at Bandita, Feline Kujita, and Dear Lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening.